Today is World Mental Health Day, and Andy Taylor's here with five things that we can all do to improve our mental well-being. Chris, we went to psychologist and life coach Dr. Randy Kamen for advice on everyday ways to improve our mental health. The number one thing she said we all need is a trustworthy friend. Friendships have been shown to be the key to health, happiness, and longevity. So let's say you're really mentally healthy, you still need to have friendships. Dr. Kamen says a common mistake that weighs down your mental health is not being grateful. And instead, we're looking at what everybody else has and feeling a sense of lacking. There are ways to teach gratitude, and Dr. Kamen has videos on her website explaining that in detail. Now, she also teaches people suffering from anxiety that there's a way to help relax. The number one antidote to anxiety is learning to breathe abdominally because here's the thing, you cannot be anxious and relaxed at the same time. As for the last two tips, the first is practicing self-compassion, learning to treat ourselves better like we would treat a best friend or even a child. And second, forgiveness. Dr. Kamen says the person we may need to forgive the most is ourselves. All right, Annie, thank you. Vegan, paleo, gluten-free, they're all really popular diets right now. But just because you're eating that way, should your pet be eating that way? We're going to get some answers from a veterinarian tomorrow here on The Now. Those rain chances on the rise and back with us throughout the day on Friday, but we've got one more mild day in the forecast too. Temperatures ranging from the upper 60s in Lafayette and Rockville to 75 degrees in Columbus. Now by Saturday morning, we'll be into the 30s. Lots of sunshine is back with us, but 56 for that afternoon high. It's going to be a little breezy there, not only Saturday, but Sunday and tomorrow. At least on Sunday, it'll be a warming wind as we get back to around 65. Next few days of the forecast as we put it all together for you. And there you go, 37 by Saturday morning. Thanks for joining us for the Now Indy. The News at 6 starts right now. This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. Now at 6, RTV6 working for you and getting results. Our reporting leads the Attorney General to step in to help residents of a Southwest Side mobile home park who are just days away from losing their homes. But from our standpoint, we're here to provide protection to the homeowners, making certain that their rights are protected. And now those residents have hope. The Attorney General delivering the message personally that nothing will happen until this case goes before a judge. I took some weight off my head and shoulders. And tonight, the state is filing a lawsuit against the owners of an Indianapolis mobile home park after residents called RTV6 for help. Yeah, our team has been working since August to get help for residents of the I-70 mobile home park on the southwest side. Ever since they were told they either had to move their homes from the property or they'd be demolished. We got involved. Now the Attorney General is taking action tonight. We have team coverage tonight on these major developments. We begin with RTV6's Stephanie Wade at the mobile home park where she spoke with Attorney General Curtis Hill. Stephanie. Mark and Amanda, in August, the mobile home park told people they had two months to get out. But today, the Attorney General came to the park himself and went knocking door to door, handing out these notices to residents that say, not so fast. And all of a sudden, I'm told we're, we got to we gotta leave just out from nowhere. You know, our choice got taken from us. You know, where you people don't have a choice, get out. 60 days. That's how long people were given to pack up and move out. It's putting people in peril. You know, because they can't afford to move their trailers. So a lot of them's just going moving in with other people. And some, some of them's in the street now. But now, that all might change. The state filed a lawsuit against the owner of the I-70 Mobile Home Park, citing several violations, including deceptive consumer sales and exploiting senior citizens. The owner of the I-70 Mobile Lot uh, has neither secured a permit nor done anything to affect a transfer of title, uh, therefore placing the, the consumers or the homeowners into a heck of a bind by demanding that they leave uh, without providing them with the, the uh, wherewithal to take their property with them. Today, the Attorney General was granted a temporary restraining order until the 18th, preventing Blue Lakes Incorporated from closing or excavating the park and shutting off any utilities for residents until a judge 
decides what happens next. Weight off my head and shoulders. I'm yeah. Yeah. The uh, consumers became aware of their opportunity to, uh, to work this process through our office uh, by their work with the media. Good. Thank you. Now, the hearing is set for next Friday, October 18th. Some residents may be contacted to testify, but General Hill tells me nothing will happen to these people's homes until the judge decides what's next. This is a story we will stay on top of. Working for you tonight, Stephanie Wade. RTV6. Our team coverage continues. Stephanie, thank you. RTV6 reporter Cameron Riddle was the first reporter to go to work for the residents of the I-70 mobile home park and tell their story. And he's here to share how we got to this point. Cameron. Well, Mark and Amanda, it all started with a phone call when a group of residents called us here at RTV6 saying that they were being forced to vacate from their mobile homes. But of course, that doesn't include the land that they sit on. Now tonight, they are getting the help that they need in the form of legal action from the Indiana Attorney General's office and a restraining order temporarily keeping them from being forced from their homes. Well, we've gotten a lot of publicity and a lot of people you know, reaching out finally, you know, thanks to you guys. Oh, well, you may re remember our story from originally back in August when we first arrived at the I-70 mobile home park. That night, roughly 70 residents gathered together asking for help after receiving a notice to vacate from the owners of the mobile home park. That's Blue Lakes Incorporated. That generic white piece of paper said residents and all of their belongings had to be off the property in less than 60 days or by October 15th, apparently due to issues with the water pipes running to each of the mobile homes. Of course, for the residents here, picking up and moving is way easier said than done when moving includes moving an entire mobile home, which costs thousands of dollars. That's money that many of the residents, including Jay Moorhead, say they simply don't have. If you can imagine taking your home and picking it up and moving it somewhere else, it's not something you do overnight. You know, they're evicting us and saying that we have to be out in 60 days. It's not like living in an apartment and you're going to move your trailer or you're going to pack up your stuff and get out of the apartment and get another one. It's not that way. So the following week, RTV6 stayed on the story, following up with the health department and water company. Both organizations told RTV6 there were no reported water problems, which of course didn't add up with that notice that was left for residents. So with that in mind, we contacted attorney Chase Haller with the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic. Haller visited the mobile home park with us, talked with residents, and even handed out complaint forms for the attorney general's office. Those forms eventually caught the eye of the AG and an investigation quickly began. And while the legal work was being done behind the scenes, work was also being done to help residents find a new place to live. After seeing RTV6's continuing stories on the mobile home park, several organizations and even elected officials joined together to host a resource fair for the dozens of residents trying to figure out where to go after October 15th. State Representative Justin Moed told RTV6 he's now considering legislation that would offer more protections for mobile home owners in Indiana. These folks have to figure out how they're gonna move their home, an entire house. And, and so we need to make sure state law provides them with enough, an adequate time to be notified that this is coming and make sure the landlord, the property owner has adequate, you know, has to give adequate time for the residents to move on. And all of that brings us up to the to today with all eyes now on a problem that residents didn't think anyone would see. Attorney General Curtis Hill filed a lawsuit on behalf of a number of residents who were sold mobile homes on that property, but of course never received a title. The lawsuit also accuses Blue Lakes Incorporated of deceptive consumer sales, knowingly violating the Consumer Sales Act, not obtaining permits to sell mobile homes in Marion County, and exploiting senior citizens. So guys, of course, the question now is, what happens next right. after we've mm -hmm. been through this two month long saga? Uh, the Blue Lakes Incorporated side would likely get a lawyer if they don't already have one, and that is to get in, prepar in prepar pre preparation, say that three yeah. times fast, uh, for October 18th when they will go in front of a, uh, a hearing with a judge to decide what happens next. So okay. in the meantime, the residents do not have to move until they hear from a judge in short. Which is a gotcha. welcome break for them, I'm yes, sure. Yes, yes. Some of them still, of course, don't have a place to go, but uh, we'll be talking with some of them. At 
uh, and continuing to follow their story and see what happens next. Okay, for them. Cameron, thanks for staying on top of this. Absolutely. Cameron, thank you. Tonight, there is a warrant out for the arrest of a man charged in a deadly hit and run on the northwest side. 30 year old Timothy Poole is charged in the September 11th crash that killed 14 year old Louis Daniel Patino Ortega. We told you about this case on Tuesday. Ortega was hit and killed on his motorbike while running an errand for his family. This happened on Coyle Street off of Michigan Road. Court documents say the driver of the car left the vehicle running and took off on foot. Police are looking for Poole. If you know where he is, call Metro Police or Crime Stoppers. Tonight, the state health department reports two more vaping related deaths in Indiana. That makes the total now of three since September 6. The deaths occurred in adults and were confirmed today by the CDC. Indiana is currently investigating 75 cases of severe lung injury linked to vaping. That number has doubled in the past month. Most of the cases are in people ages 16 to 29. The November election is still about three weeks away, but the Republican candidate for Indianapolis mayor has already announced who his chief of police would be. Republican Jim Merritt said he wants Democrat Bill Benjamin to be his police chief. Benjamin was a 27 year veteran of IMPD and rose to the rank of deputy chief during his tenure. Benjamin lost in the 2018 Democratic primary to be Marion County Sheriff. Merritt said he and Benjamin have spoken frequently about public safety, but did not say if he would accept the job. We've had conversations. He has uh, helped me with our, um, our crime prevention and our, our crime uh, uh, plank in our, our campaign. And uh, I've known him for a long time and I'm anxious for him to tell the media his answer. A Hogshead campaign spokesperson defended current chief Brian Roach and said, quote, Mayor Hogshead continues to believe there is no better person to lead our police force. There's no dispute that teachers play an incredibly important role in shaping and nurturing the lives of our children. And today, the woman named Indiana's Teacher of the Year got quite a surprise. You can see the shock on the face of Danville Community School Corporation's Katie Porcho as she walked into school assembly today at North Elementary School. She was cheered on by the staff, students, and family as she learned from State School Superintendent Jennifer McCormick that she is Indiana's Teacher of the Year for 2020. Porcho teaches art to students in kindergarten through second grade at North Elementary. Seeing their faces reminds me how important this job is as we are preparing students, as we are um, training, cultivating their, their hearts for continued learning, and it's an important, incredible job to do. In addition to teaching art, Porsche is also a professional artist who exhibits her work. She will now represent Indiana in the National Teacher of the Year competition. Congratulations to her. And love that work of art that was there behind her, assuming that's uh, from her. Yeah. So good to see her doing that and leading the way there. Still ahead here on the news at six, another educator making a real positive impact on the lives of young people. And this man is all about helping to bring purpose to the lives of the students he meets. You'll meet tonight's winner of the Jefferson Award for Multiplying Good coming up. The French Lake Resort is hosting another major championship golf tournament next week. The senior LPGA Tour has a special local partnership. Coming up in sports, we show you how this one is for the kids. And get that rain gear ready because we've got a fairly damp Friday ahead of us. We'll talk about how much rain to expect. You're watching RTV6 News at 6. Prices at Ross. Yes for less. Well, tonight, a leader among giants, his goal to make sure young people reach their highest potential and make it to graduation day. Our Rafael Sanchez joins us with this month's Jefferson Award for Multiplying Good recipient. So Wayne Township is the home of the giants. And tonight, this father and educator, he stands proud side by side with his team. What's up? Hey. Let's go. What's up, DJ? Doing all right. How are you? Mom okay? Hi, Kennedy. How you doing? Good game yesterday. Every morning, you'll find Keelan Mark. I'm Mr. Mark. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. In the labyrinth of hallways. <laughs> <laughs> Go to class. That connect the Chapel Hill family. You have to give kids the conversation, talk to them about, you know, what's ahead, the vision. And then you have to give it, give them an opportunity to live that out, to exercise it, to put it into action. Mr. Mark, Mr. Mark. We visited Mr. Mark 
while he held his first official meeting as principal of the 7th and 8th grade center. We were not on the agenda, so he rolled with it. More on that in a moment. <laughs> After the first bell. But all these have in common is that they're all about creativity. Students in this class were continuing life lessons about leadership, service, and academics. Uh, that's a great summer. Discussions and debates which began this summer. So somebody is strongly disagree, tell me what. They have creativity. And will develop through the school year. It's an extension of the summer academy known as Young Men of Purpose Mentoring. Well, one thing I really did like that I learned is like the real meaning of like love. Not like actual love, like boyfriend or girlfriend type love, but like what love actually means, like brotherly love. And like... He taught you that? Yes. So you appreciate that? Yes, I appreciate that very much. Mr. Mark brought the Young Men of Purpose program to Wayne Township Schools six years ago. The goals, to improve grades, raise self-esteem, and light a path to success. Experiences wanted for every child among the educators in this room. So it was time to explain our appearance. And so because that person has been able to share love and help young people achieve academically and helped people through mentoring programs and shown young people that they matter every single day, it is with great honor that RTV6 presents the Jefferson Award for Multiplying Good to Mr. Keelan Mark. I am truly honored, uh, blessed, happy um, of just having the privilege to work at this school in Wayne Township. Um, the things that I try to do for our students, try to do for our staff and families are the things that I try to do at home with my wife and son. So the humble guy with the gold medallion has a busy day ahead. The number of young men that he has positively impacted as a result of his work with them is immeasurable. Good morning. Hi, Paris. Good game yesterday. The man in the hallway, making sure the hallmarks he champions, good character, hard work, and excellence move from classroom to classroom. And we surprised him. Now, Mr. Mark would like to one day have a school dedicated to young men with a purpose, a full day of academics and learning life skills to succeed throughout life. Congratulations to him and the entire Wayne Township family. Amanda? Rafael, thank you for that story. And to nominate someone you know who is making a difference, just go to our website, theindiechannel.com, select the menu and the life section, and click on Multiplying Good. Kyle. We are enjoying some very mild temperatures across central Indiana, and enjoy it while you can, because we do have some big changes heading our way, but right now, 76 degrees with those cloudy skies in downtown, a little more sunshine in Kokomo, 75, and close to 80 degrees right now in Bloomington. Even tonight, we'll stay mild by early October. October standards, low temperatures ranging from the upper 50s to the middle 60s. That'll be because of this blanket of cloud cover and a light southeast wind. You notice there's some rain back in Illinois trying to work its way our direction. So far, it's kind of falling apart, but I think an isolated shower storm is possible during the overnight. No severe weather out there. We certainly need the rain because with the latest drought monitor put out today, you can see that moderate drought expanding around Richmond, continuing into Seymour, and we've got abnormally dry conditions across much of central Indiana. So here's a look at the timeline. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, we'll have a wave of some isolated showers for the morning. Lunch hour, still fairly spotty. It's as we get into the afternoon and evening. For that evening rush hour, we'll have a little more widespread rain. Again, an isolated thunderstorm possible as we get to 10 o'clock in the evening. Still some scattered showers. So high school football games tomorrow evening will be impacted by some of that rain. But quickly overnight tomorrow night, those rain showers are going to push off to the east. It'll leave behind about a third to a half inch of rain, get under a thunderstorm. Certainly could see between a half and an inch of wet weather. Temperature-wise, tomorrow we'll hold it in the 60s, but into the afternoon, enough with that southeast breeze that we'll get back into the lower 70s, but then a quick 
falling temperature here as we get ready for those high school football games. Kickoff temperature in the middle 50s, 51 as we get toward the end of the game with areas of rain around and it's going to be breezy. Tomorrow, southeast winds around 15 miles per hour. That'll carry over but out of the west as we go into tomorrow evening and check out Saturday morning. We've got lows into the lower and middle 30s. I think we would have more in the way of some frost around if we weren't going to have the breezy conditions and you can see that we're kind of on target here. Indianapolis, Bloomington typically see that first patchy frost temperatures in the middle 30s by the 11th and 12th of October. After that, temperatures are going to warm pretty quickly as we get into the seven day planning forecast. We'll go from 72 though on Friday to just 56 with some sunshine on Saturday. It's going to be breezy throughout the weekend, but at least on Sunday, we'll flip those numbers around, get us to 65 for the afternoon high with some sunny skies and keep it mild through Tuesday. That's the next chance for rain and then highs are back in the 50s Wednesday and Thursday. All right, fall's here. <laughs> It's definitely right. here this weekend, and Dave First is here with sports. But not before golf, guys. Hey, thanks. Good evening. For the second time in less than a month, women's golf hitting the state. This time it's the annual Senior LPGA Championship, but it's more than a golf tournament. Ultimately, it is for the kids in the Sports Extra Spotlight. Bruce Litsky said. It's one of the Midwest's most majestic layouts. French Lick's Pete Dye course, home next week to the third senior LPGA championship. But what really hits home. We're going to go right here. Perfect. Is the pay it forward approach the pros get here. The tournament's beneficiary, Riley Hospital for Children. The event really wasn't any more about the competition as much as what we were doing for the community and what a great experience that I had. So um, being here today and seeing it more firsthand um, is very special. And special for 14-year-old Braden Thomasitis. I have uh, spina bifida, which is basically like how I describe it is a broken back. Braden among those getting first-hand instruction and getting to know something about the pros. Very friendly. I heard they're not as friendly during the tournament. When they compete against one another? Is that yes, <laughs> that's what I heard. So we'll see this time. Braden plans on being at the tournament as well as many other patients and families. It's special for it's us. Special, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's really special. We uh, we started this adventure with Riley in 2014 with our Legends Tour Championship, and it's just carried on through. And if and, and nobody can come to this hospital and see what the work that they do here, and not be impressed and not be uh, feel it in their heart. So there'll be more than golf on the line for the over 45 crowd. There will also be a legacy, lifting up a trophy, and spirits raising the bar at one of golf's rising facilities. It is the championship, to be honest with you. Um, such a magnificent golf course, beautiful. It can nip you right in the rear. It's not easy. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's, uh, Pete Dye, he had some moments on there. Um, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, the designer Pete Dye didn't mess around with that one. Three day, 54 hole tournament, no cuts. Begins Monday at 10 a.m., just five bucks to get in. And it's Thursday, back by popular demand. It's our Pee Wee Play of the Week. Here we go, taking to Brownsburg, the Brownsburg Junior Football League Championship. Chris Farnsworth Jr., the handoff to Marcus Virgil. And before you can say Brownsburg, it's a 75 yard touchdown run untouched. Best part of the video watch the coaches on the near sideline, no reaction. No big deal. It's like they've seen this before. Kudos to offensive linemen Jackson Renner, Kingston Baker, and Jonathan Turkios. Raiders win 28-0 the championship and our Pee-wee Play of the Week. Here's how you get involved. Email me your video, peewee at wrtv.com. Tag me on Twitter at Dave First or on Facebook, Dave First dash RTV6. Details, names, final score, et cetera, will get you on. The News at 6 continues after this. Yours at enjoyillinois.com. Get ready for some changes. We got a lot of them in that seven day forecast. 72 tomorrow with showers and thunderstorms and then much cooler to start the weekend. Temperatures in the 30s by Saturday morning. Up next here on Channel 6 is World News with David Muir. And then join us again for the News at 7. We'll see you then.